Welcome to the Philosophemes channel. In this seminar, we will examine a passage from Nietzsche's Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, or The Joyful Quest. There are so many wonderful passages in The Joyful Quest. However, this passage from Book 1, Section 54, really is important for us. And so I wanted to, to take a look at it. It really functions like a kind of key to open up a lot of higher thoughts in Nietzsche, for example. <clears throat> All right, so... This is, of course, from 1882, and I have discussed the history of this text in Nietzsche's canon, so I'm not going to go into all of the details of you know, what parts were written when and so forth, uh, and its relation, for example, to, to Kierkegaard's thinking. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at The Joyful Quest, Book 1, Section 54, and actually it naturally divides into four parts. So I'll be looking at each, I'll divide it into four parts and be looking at the four, four parts with you. Then we're going to ask the question, what is the difference between romantic irony and insincerity? This question and the discussion of it comes from the second edition of my book, Full Throttle Heart. Next, we're going to look at the division of the passages as four parts, and then we're going to discuss uh, each of the four passages. All right, so here we go. The Joyful Quest, Book 1, Section 54, The Consciousness of Appearance. The Consciousness of Appearance, How Wonderful and New Yet how gruesome and ironic I find my position vis-a-vis -vis the whole of existence in the light of my insight. I have discovered for myself that the human and animal past, indeed the whole primal age and past of all sentient being, continues in me to invent, to love, to hate, and to infer. I suddenly woke up in the midst of this dream, but only to the consciousness that I am dreaming, and that I must go on dreaming lest I perish, as a somnamb somnambulist <laughs> must go on dreaming lest he fall. What is appearance for me now? Certainly not the opposite of some essence. What could I say about any essence except to name the attributes of its appearance? Certainly not a dead mask that one could place on an unknown X or remove from it. Appearance is for me that which lives and is effective and goes so far in its self-mockery that it makes me feel that this is appearance and will-o'-the-wisp, and a dance of spirits, and nothing more, that among all these dreamers, I too, who know, am dancing my dance, that the knower is a means for prolonging the earthly dance, and thus belongs to the masters of ceremony of existence, and that the sublime consistency and interrelatedness of all knowledge perhaps is and will be the highest means to preserve the universality of dreaming and the mutual comprehension of all dreamers and thus also the continuation of the dream. All right. So... The aesthetic dimension of divine affectivity. What is the difference between romantic irony and insincerity? 
So to take something's dimensions is to measure it. If the metaphor with which the Enlightenment liked to think was machine, Romanticism's is life. The term machine comes with the implication of measurable moving parts, scientifically precise predictions, and no mysterious dimensions. Yet the parts and depths of life strike us as uncountable, unfathomable, and of course, life is often unpredictable and mysterious. An aesthetic dimension refers to our sensory experience of life, that life exceeds our capacity to fully experience it, given the limits of our sensory capacities, is a transcendental truth. Thus, on the one hand, it is neither subjective nor objective. Rather, it is an insight gained by considering our limitations. Yet, on the other hand, it is true that there are both subjective and objective aspects to our sensory experiences. This means there are three aspects for us to consider regarding an aesthetic dimension. Dimensions of Aesthetic Affectivity The idea, then, is that in being affected by existence, we have three different ways to consider the aesthetic dimension that manifests. Most people will think we are talking about the subjective aspect of the aesthetic dimension. However, we are actually discussing the difference between the transcendental on the one hand and the subjective and objective on the other. Further, we are taking the transcendental to be the most primordial of the three aspects, and therefore the subjective and objective aspects of the aesthetic dimension can be seen as the expressions of the transcendental within our sensory capacities. Thus, what we are discussing is beyond the objective-subjective distinction. It contains them both and is universal. Dionysian play and Apollonian illusion. So we've discussed this already, um, so we'll just mention it here, that the relation between the transcendental on the one hand and the subjective objective on the other is the distinction between Dionysian play and Apollonian illusion, respectively. This is precisely why Nietzsche can call the Apollonian illusory, because it cannot characterize the transcendental. Of course, we should be thinking of the Kantian thing in itself here. So, neither objective nor subjective. Importantly, then, in this context, when we use either the subjective or the objective to attempt to characterize the transcendental, there will always be some irony involved. This is a highly misunderstood insight. So let's get clear on it here. The, dis the distinction we need to come to understand is between irony and romantic irony. Namely, both sarcasm and insincerity are forms of irony, because they are instances of language which negate what they actually say. In contrast, romantic irony does not negate what it says. However, it does call what it says into question. Hence, Apollonian representations of Dionysian play are seen in the light of romantic irony. It is in the way that they are, it is in that way that they are ironic. This will help us think through Nietzsche's discussion of lucid dreaming. So, waking in the dream does not wake us from the dream. 
The following passage then has been divided into four parts. After reading the first part, you should see that we are absolutely on the right track with Nietzsche, since that part should make complete sense now. The remaining parts discuss how realizing the illusory or romantically ironic nature of the Apollonian does not change the Apollonian. Yet, how are we to avoid believing that nothing is true or valuable in light of such an insight? Right? How are we to avoid becoming nihilists? Nietzsche is explicit here. That is, waking in the dream does not wake us from the dream. Okay. So the passage in question here comes from Die Frohlich Wissenschaft, Book 1, Section 54. Here is Kaufman's translation. The consciousness of appearance, how wonderful and new, yet how gruesome and ironic I find my position vis-a-vis -vis the whole of existence in the light of my insight. I have discovered for myself that the human and animal past, indeed the whole primal age and past of all sentient being, continues in me to invent to love, to hate, and to infer. I suddenly woke up in the midst of this dream and to the consciousness that I am dreaming and that I must go on dreaming lest I perish from nihilism. What is appearance for me now? What is appearance now that I realize that I am in a dream? What is appearance now that I realize that what is appearing is a part of Apollonian illusion, and that Apollonian illusion is related in a romantically ironic way to the transcendental dimension that is expressing itself, and that transcendental dimension that is expressing itself as Apollonian play, sorry, as Apollonian illusion, is Dion Dionysian play. Appearances for me, that which lives and is effective, and goes so far in its self-mockery that it makes me feel that this is appearance and will of the wisp and a dance of spirits and nothing more. So the self-mockery of the Apollonian illusion reveals in some way the Dionysian play as a dance of spirits. That among all these dreamers, I too, who know, am dancing, my dance. That the knower is a means for prolonging the earthly dance, and thus belongs to the masters of ceremony of existence. And that the sublime consistency and interrelatedness of all knowledge perhaps is and will be the highest means to preserve the universality of dreaming and the mutual comprehension of all dreamers, and thus the continuation of the dream. Okay, so to conclude here. Thus, to affirm life is to affirm in a romantically ironic way, because we recognize the inevitably illusory nature of appearance. Whether we interpret the aesthetic dimension subjectively or objectively, the transcendental will always remain higher. It is, the, it is beyond our mortal determinations of good and evil. And yet, our existence is also transcendental in relation to our consciousness. And thus, we are inextricably a part of the Dionysian play. The mortality of our individuality will die. However, the God who dances through us is immortal. And from the point of view of that God in the Dionysian worldview, there is no us. There is only the rapturous, fatal ecstasy of a dancing God.